My name's Sam. Uh, I'm one of the founders of Account Bouncer. Uh, it's a security as a service uh, startup, I guess. As with everything else in the Valley, we've got all sorts of fun little startups. Uh, and my part of the world is trying to bring the level of security that people like uh, eBay, PayPal, Amazon, LinkedIn, Facebook, all of those people have where they've got large networks uh, of distributed accounts that, so they can see when somebody's trying to compromise uh, people's accounts and bringing that to uh, everyone else. And as a part of that, we use uh, Jenkins to build vHosts, uh, test environments for our PHP application that we use to run, run our web interface. So I'm going to talk to you about using Jenkins to build Apache vHosts for GitHub pull requests on PHP applications. So as I said, I'm the founder of Account Bouncer, uh, but I, I've also had a few other roles. Uh, LinkedIn, I was a site reliability engineer uh, and working on search. So if search goes down, you couldn't find someone that was, uh, someone, someone would page me and I get to figure out why our search systems have fallen over. Uh, I used to work at Sears Holdings. They had a, a data uh, analytics infrastructure group in San Jose. Uh, so I worked on all sorts of interesting things like real-time analytics, uh, real-time data processing, uh, Hadoop and all sorts of fun stuff around that with uh, Teradata, MicroStrategy, and whatnot. And I also worked at eBay as a software engineer in their uh, analytics and data platform group. Uh, but prior to all of that, I also worked on the Joomla project. Joomla, for those of you who don't know it, is an open source PHP uh, CMS. It also runs dominantly on MySQL, but these days obviously runs on Microsoft SQL Server and a whole bunch of other platforms. So essentially from 2005 to, to 2012, I worked on the Joomla project. I did stuff with Joomla code, which was Joomla's equivalent of SourceForge. So it was a code hosting repository for Joomla projects. And I also worked on build systems with Joomla. So we had stuff like a pull request tester. Uh, I also did all of the packages and the builds and the patch packages for Joomla. And from Joomla, uh, I went to eBay to work on a project called a Data Hub. The Data Hub is an internet site for Joomla, based on Joomla in eBay for data. So uh, e eBay uh, uh, legal really hates this, but essentially think about uh, a Facebook for data. Uh, and if eBay legal are listening, please don't sue me. Uh, the data hub had all of the sort of stuff that you have in your normal social networking style application. We had an activity stream. Uh, we had announcements, events, all that sort of stuff. Uh, but our focus was around data. So we had reports, uh, but instead of just putting reports out there, we had the concept of being able to tell a story with your report. And we, we then took it to the next level where no matter where you were having a discussion, you could embed a live report uh, right then and there. So in this particular case, we're looking at the forum feature of the Data Hub which Im is literally embedding this live report. So you can see what's there, uh, the measure names on the left, and you could select, select those items or deselect them, and the chart will re-render itself on the fly in the browser as you're looking at it. Now, there are challenges in building a system like this because we interact and depend on so many different systems. That chart in the previous slide was a Tableau rendering. We also had MicroStrategy slides. We pulled information from Teradata and we also had, you know, obviously internal app features such as, you know, an activity feed. We had discussions, we had groups, we had documents, we had various things. And as we were building things, you know, we would change the way the user interface looks for different items. Uh, sometimes it was just our designer who got bored and decided that he didn't like the color, color scheme that we had and he would completely change it. Uh, and sometimes that would hit the QA environment and our product manager would go, Hey, Kyle, what up? You know, it caused a few surprises. Uh, but more importantly, building out uh, new user interaction flows was hard to do well on this sort of a platform. Because everything is interactive and linked together, you need to make sure that all of your linked data is available in an environment that's safe to test on. Now, we have QA and we had dev environments, uh, but testing each of those flows out was you know, sometimes time consuming and hard to do in just one environment because on a large team, everyone's trying to test out their, all of their little changes and their interactions. And to make things even harder, 
we had our design team who were primarily based in Austin. Uh, we had our main engineering and quality team in San Jose, and we also had an offshore team for engineering and quality in, in Shanghai. And at any given point in time, we were re working on you know, three major different features and trying to all integrate them together as one cohesive team. And that meant that we would, try, we would end up prematurely checking into our QA environment so that we could get the QA side ready to sign off on it so that we could make our release dates. And we generally had two-week releases for, for this particular product. Uh, and the problem with this is it's then hard to evolve these ideas and get feedback. Because all of this ties together and all of this interacts, a developer will build something on his desktop, put it out there, try it. Then he'll, he'll try and push it onto the dev environment. But because there's contention there, you end up having these, these weird integration staging branches that a whole bunch of people merge stuff into, then somebody merges something out, and it ends up with this dance where uh, our QA environments essentially became overloaded. So while we had all of these problems, we also had a few solutions. We had an internal GitHub Enterprise Edition, and GitHub pull requests, in my, my humble opinion, are one of the greatest contributions to, to code collaborations because pull requests provide this really great place for automated testing. If you haven't used pull requests before, they, are, they provide a git checkoutable repository that you can just check out everything as it is, as the developer intends it to be. And you can then review that and, and work on that. And that's brilliant for automated testing. If you've used uh, other review tools like Garrett or Review Board, they give you an option to download a patch. Great. But then you have to check out your repository, check out the patch, apply the patch, you've got to manage all of that. You know, that's challenging. The other things that GitHub pull requests give you is a great place to communicate about code changes. Now, some of the Garrett and uh, Review Board have caught up here, but uh, back when we were working on this, GitHub's reviews allowed you to make comments on lines of code, cone changes, and see how those comments evolved over time as the pull request evolves over time. So a pull request becomes much more like a conversation between the developer proposing the change and everybody else reviewing it. And because it's all Git and distributed, you can uh, fork then their, their, their pull request and they can merge in their, your changes into their pull request and have this uh, really awesome uh, development workflow. And fundamentally, I believe that GitHub pull requests are a much better way for reviewing uh, code changes. So the solution we did was, of, co of course, to build on this. So we already had automated uh, tests. Unit tests are, are part of the course, and we also had co your, your standard code quality tests. And they obviously ran automatically on our trunk build. But with GitHub pull requests, what we could do is before we even merge those code changes, test them in an environment and get a resp response back long before we even thought about merging it. And what Jenkins will do with the GitHub pull request builder is it will check out that pull request, run all of your automated tests on it, and then comment back to GitHub saying, this, this pull request is good to merge, or this pull request had test issues, and then it'll give you a link back to that instance. So building on that, what we had was an a system where we would build a dedicated environment. Now, a couple of years ago, this was something relatively new these days. Uh, it seems a lot more common. The, the difference here is that we're doing this for every single pull request. So every, instead of building a one-off environment, firing off your unit tests, your Selenium tests, and all of that, every time somebody proposes a change, we go off and we build a dedicated environment for you. Now, in the demo I'm going to give, I've actually pared it down back to the simplest uh, example that I could think of. Uh, but Hopefully, it's enough to convey the idea of how all of this stuff can, can work for you. Now, this gives you two extra features above and beyond. So QA can run their unit, UI unit tests, their Selenium tests, their integration tests, all of, all of the sort of fun stuff that QA environments are essentially built for against pull requests as they happen. So as code changes, code evolves, uh, our QA developers can see where their tests are breaking, how they're breaking, and it isn't a surprise that when, when a, a big feature change lands in the QA environment, they're like, what's this? 
You've gone off, you've changed the entire left navigation structure, all of my UI tests are broken now because it, it was relying on this button that you've just removed. Now, that means that QA have to you know, spend time after you've merged everything, after you've integrated everything, to update their tests and hopefully give you a clean bill of health. But by putting this against pull requests, they can run their code, they can set up their own parallel branches to test stuff so that once your code gets merged, they can merge their QA changes and the time difference between uh, your code being merged and your code being QA certified is a lot smaller. The other thing we found with this is that uh, your product team can review, review user experience changes and you can iterate on them. So you can build something, quickly build up a dedicated environment to play with it, have it, have it come out, have it code, have it have its own database, and people can iterate on the changes and they can see how it looks. And maybe you know, it doesn't meet you know, this, this release cycle. Maybe we have to push it back two weeks. That's not a problem because you haven't merged it down to master. Now you're probably thinking, or you might be thinking, what about feature toggles? You know, feature toggles are also, in my humble opinion, really awesome. Uh, but when you're looking to test a change as you're building it, you don't necessarily want to always guard it behind a feature toggle. As, you, as you're developing on something, you obviously, as you want to re release it to prod, you're going to hopefully guard that. Hopefully nobody's, well, maybe somebody is, uh, releasing all of these code changes immediately to prod. Uh, but you know, most of the time, if you're, say, building a completely new feature, you want to hide it behind a feature toggle. Uh, so you can either ramp it to a portion of your users or you can enable or disable it in case it causes you issues. Now, the great thing about this is that basically your uh, dedicated pull request environment can have all of those toggles enabled for you so that QA can go and verify everything. And when it goes, when it goes all the way live to prod, everything's still honky-dory. So this is completely compatible with feature toggles. So I'm going to go through the setup. As I said, this was the simplest setup I could think of uh, to get this working. It doesn't go through any sort of complicated workflows. Uh, I, I saw a presentation before. It's like I've got three VMs. We've got all of this. It's just like, OK, I'm not going to be able to replicate that very easily. My goal is at the end of this presentation, you will have enough information, and hopefully with a copy of these slides, which will be available online, be able to go home and build your own and then integrate whatever sort of uh, flow you want to into this sort of a setup. Okay, so obviously this all starts with a GitHub pull request. Uh, so you have your uh, have a repository in GitHub, uh, and then somebody's working on changes, uh, and then they create a pull request. So Jenkins has a GitHub pull request builder. GitHub pull request builder can either pull uh, your GitHub repository. So if you've got a public one, it'll pull that. Or if you have a GitHub Enterprise Edition uh, set up, it'll also, it also integrates with that. And then it takes all of the pull requests for a particular repository and tries to build them. So what we're aiming to do with that is we want to create Apache, an Apache directory that we can uh, check out the code changes to so that we can do stuff with it. So in this case, I've created a, a var www PR tester. PR1 is going to be the number of my pull requests, so the first pull request. Uh, and then a web, web folder, which is going to be my, my document root. Uh, so the aim of, of Jenkins is to create this directory with the code in it that we want. How, how you do that is obviously up to you, but I'm going to give you the, the simplest, quickest way of, of making that happen. Then we configure Apache using the mod vhost alias module to point to that document root so that you can see everything. Uh, and in my test environment, uh, I also have a, a bind nine host uh, that basically creates a wildcard DNS entry for you, for me. Uh, if you're in an enterprise environment, you will obviously have a DNS server set up for you. If you're playing on this stuff at home or in some other environment, uh, bind nine is the, the quickest and easiest way to, to get this stuff up, even if bind requires almost a degree to understand what the config files actually mean. But the good news is, this is included. So that's my setup. So I, I generally run this uh, on Debian boxes. So bind nine, uh, Apache 2.2, and PHP 5.4 uh, running as a module, which is one of the more standard Debian configurations. Mod via host alias, as I mentioned before. Uh, when I was building the demos, I did this on Jenkins 1.583. I think we're up to 584 or 585 by now. 
uh, with with some of the security fixes that have come in lately. Uh, so, but you know, most of this is is pretty flexible and works. And obviously, you need GitHub to make this happen. So GitHub, the the public facing GitHub, uh, either with private repositories or even or, or public even if you're an open source project, or even the the, the internal GitHub enterprise. Uh, at both Sears and eBay, uh, we had GitHub enterprise that uh, I built a lot of this stuff off of as well. So. I'm going to very quickly go through these slides because they're mostly there so that you can download them and copy them later. Uh, essentially, this is a, the, a very simple uh, zone for the test zone, uh, and it's going to point to a file called test.zone, and essentially all it's going to do is create a wildcard entry for a particular host. Replace 10.0.1.11 with wherever you're hosting this uh, for, your, for your application. The next step, again, this is hopefully all for, for the internet, is we want to set up mod v host alias. So what mod v host alias does, it's a built-in, uh, or it ships with uh, Apache. It's a module that allows you to define a particular pattern, if you will, for vhosts on a particular server. So in this case, I'm using the pattern uh, var dub 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 PR tester percent one slash web. So what that's going to do is percent one will take the first domain component, the host component essentially, out of the, the, the host name and put it into that URL path. And then it'll try and build, try and see if that particular path exists and serve that as your document root. And if it doesn't find it, it'll give you a very nice forbidden error, uh, which you, know, you can obviously customize through your standard Apache setup. Uh, this is again designed as a, a standalone config, so you can basically pick this up and throw this in your Apache config in the vhost directory and it should work for you. Uh, you might need to uh, disable the default, obviously, Apache config, because mod vhost alias and the default don't play nicely with each other. So that's, that's a quick gotcha for you. So the next thing we need to do is set up Jenkins. So thankfully, this is pretty easy. Hopefully, everyone, everyone can blow through this one. So what we're going to do is we're going to install the GitHub pull request builder plugin through your standard manage Jenkins, manage plugins. Pretty, pretty stock standard. It'll pull down all of its dependencies, like every other standard Jenkins plugin, and, and configure it for you, and then you'll restart it. Now, once you've done that, you need to go in and we need to configure it. So there are a few settings we need to change. Uh, if you have a GitHub Enterprise uh, server, you need to go in and change the API URL to point to that. Uh, and if you have an access token already set up, you can put this into the access token field. Don't worry if you don't have one. What you can do is, once you've got the right API server, is click the advanced button, scroll all the way down to the bottom, there's username and password field, you click create access token, and it will go off to, to GitHub and create, create the access token and populate it for you so you can save it. Last but not least, in this particular area, uh, you need to add, uh, well, you, would you should probably add your GitHub username to the admin list. Uh, the pull request builder has concept of essentially three tiers of security. You have admins who, whose pull requests automatically get built and who can approve others to have their pull requests built. You have whitelisted users whose pull requests, again, also get built automatically. And then you have essentially everyone else. So if you're in, in an organization where it's very distributed, uh, you can basically have a set list of admins. You can have a set list of trusted users who you know aren't going to break things. And then for everyone else, you can require some sort of approval flow. The reason for this is because essentially when it runs the pull request, it's going to check out that pull request onto the machine and execute the code there. So a malicious user can go in and put whatever code they want in your Jenkins server or slave is going to go off and run it. That's obviously a big security problem. Less of an issue, obviously, if you're inside an enterprise and you know, you're in a trusted environment. But if you're working, obviously, on an open source project, you want to make sure that the pull requests that you're doing are safe to merge. So the next step is we're going to create a freestyle project. Uh, and then under this uh, source code management, you select uh, Git, Advanced. There's a few things to set here. Repository URL, so this should be your GitHub repository. Uh, this can be obviously SSH or HTTP, depending on how you want your configuration set up. Uh, generally, I actually go for HTTP because I'm lazy and I can just copy paste the URL everywhere. The next thing you need to change is the ref spec. Now, this is, this is the thing that's hidden under the advanced box. 
you've probably never seen this, you've probably never cared about it, you probably don't even know what it does. Uh, but essentially what this does is it tells us what to look for, and in this particular case, it's going to tell uh, Jenkins to look for the pull requests. Uh, last but not least, we also need to tell it which branch to build. By default, it will go off and build master. That's not the build that we want to do. We want to build the particular uh, commit that's in this pull request. There's also a few other extra settings here for, for the pull request. We essentially need to set up the build triggers. So we're not going to use the standard uh, scheduled build triggers or the, uh, the GitHub uh, URL builder. We're going to use the GitHub pull request builder because it enables, uh, it populates uh, the extra variables to make all of this stuff work. Again, we're going to hit advanced. So we come back to our whitelisted users. So these are, again, the users who can trigger a build without admin approval. Remember, your administrators can also uh, have their builds automatically done. The job level also has the option of having an organization or a set of organizations that can also be automatically whitelisted. So if you're using GitHub for uh, membership, organization membership, all of the members of this organization will automatically be whitelisted and their builds completed. And generally, if you're in a situation where uh, everyone in your organization can push to your repositories, this is more or less that same sort of automated setup. Uh, last but not least, if you're, say, running an open source pro pro project, or uh, depending on sort of your enterprise model, you may want to look at the uh, allow members of whitelisted organizations as admins. So uh, in the Joomla project, what we had was a core set of developers who had access to the organization. Some of them were admins in the organizations, but most people essentially just had commit rights. Uh, and with ticking this box, what you could do is have all of those core contributors not only be whitelisted, but also be able to approve people's uh, pull requests as they come in, uh, because they'll automatically become admins. And then what this does is it defers all of your uh, management of who can approve, approve what to, to GitHub, so that you don't have to worry about it yourself. Last but not least is the dangerous option. As with, as with everything, the, uh, you, you have a way of shooting yourself in the foot. Uh, and the GitHub pull request builder's way of shooting yourself is the, in, the put, in the foot is to build every pull request automatically without asking. So as I mentioned before, this is going to take, uh, the pull request builder takes a pull request from, from GitHub and builds and runs it on your server. And what this, uh, this option does is it says, I trust everyone to build everything on my server. Now, if you're running in an enterprise environment where you have a HR department that can fire people, that might work. If you're running an open source project, uh, probably this is not an option you want to toggle. Uh, generally, I would suggest that you would leave this at its default, which is off, unless you really, really, really trust everyone who could potentially create a pull request against your project. So the next thing we need to do with our job is we need to be able to, to get it to create the sort of structure that ModV host alias uses. And the great thing about this is it's actually really easy. Uh, and I, so when we configured mod v host alias for Apache, we gave it the var dub 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 PR tester percent one uh, slash web. I should probably update my slides to fix that. Uh, so that's what Apache is looking for. So since percent one is the first part of the domain, if we use pr1.test, the, the address that Apache will use is slash var slash dub 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 slash PR tester slash PR1 because that's the first, uh, the host component of the domain name that we've set up. And since we've set up star.test to point to our particular server, uh, everything we create there will, will go there. So what we need to do is configure Jenkins to create this directory structure for us. Fortunately, this is really simple, and this is also some of the most nastiest Jenkins shell script that I've written for a while. Uh, obviously, if you've got a better deployment method, you should use this, but to, to demonstrate the point, uh, what this basically does is it creates that directory on disk. It actually deletes it first to make sure that we've got a completely clean checkout. Uh, recreates it, copies essentially uh, the checked out repository straight across, uh, and we do a chmod on it uh, to make sure that if you've got any sort of umask, strange umask settings, this will get around that for you. Uh, obviously, this is not the greatest way to do a deployment. Do not do this at home. 
However, if you're going to test something and you want to get something up really quickly, this is the easiest way I could think of to get something up and running for you guys. Because essentially it creates a directory, it checks something out for you, and gets you up and running. Now, generally uh, what I would suggest, and what I've done in the past, is there's a few different ways of doing things. Uh, generally I would build an archive, ship the archive uh, to, to the target server and you know, extract that out and flip, uh, flip load balances or you know, whatever sort of control mechanism I'm using for versioning. Uh, I've also had Zen Server instances. Uh, eBay used to run Zen Server. Uh, well, they still probably run Zen Server. Uh, and they have a deployment mechanism where you can say, cluster deploy this package. Uh, so uh, in this case, the pa it was deploy this package to this particular host that we created on the fly. Uh, but in this particular case, to get up and running really quickly, this is the, the quickest and easiest way. Uh, and this is what I actually tested. I created a, a Debian VM to run all of this in. Uh, and we're off and running. So, at that point, I'm going to hopefully do a live demo. Uh, these are always good fun, uh, particularly when you're going to rely on an external internet connection. I'm actually, I was originally going to demo off, off uh, Debian VM, but I decided to be really lazy and just use my Mac. Uh, so, all, because all of this configuration is very straightforward, very simple, it's very easy to set up regardless of what platform you're running on, because uh, Apache PHP runs just about everywhere. Mod vhost is, of course, uh, a, a standard Apache module, and Jenkins, as we know, runs everywhere, well, just about everywhere that you care about. Uh, so I'm actually going to demo it on my, my Mac laptop as well, just to, to get, get some stuff up. OK. Let's make sure that everything is still alive. So I have, I have this uh, GitHub repository that I've created. Uh, and I've been using to test with, uh, and at the moment it only has a readme file in it, but you can see that I've, I've been uh, doing some changes with it. I also have a couple of pull requests sitting here for it. Uh, I have this one pull request that adds a new index.php file, uh, and apparently uh, this is uh, from my live demo branch that I was testing out on. Apparently this, this merged successfully. Uh, I can actually have a look at this and say, oh, we added a, a very simple uh, HTML file and a bit of PHP info. Uh, what else do we have here? We also have a revert of a revert of adding new index.php file. That looks interesting. So we have a revert of a revert. So we have five files changed in this. So we updated the, the readme file, we have an about file, we have a credits file, uh, we have an index.php file, and we have this crazy nav thing. Uh, also, don't build a PHP application this way uh, while, you, while we're at it. Uh, again, very simple example of how to, how to get up and running with things. Okay. So, what we're going to do is we're going to create a new job. Uh, live demo. Freestyle project. Okay. And this is the part where my laptop just explodes and completely bombs out. Just thinking about it. Whoa, look at that. Worked. Okay, so we need our GitHub URL. So let's just put that in there. So again, so uh, that's setting up the GitHub project. All that actually does in reality is put a little link on the left and, and set up a few things. Not absolutely necessary, but I like to put it in there since it's essentially the same HTTP URL. Whoa. So, okay, so we're going to select git. Our repository URL is going to be this. Uh, I already have some credentials set up. I'm going to go over here and I'm going to cheat because I don't actually have that ref spec thing memorized. Okay. So, we're going to copy that ref spec and put that there. Thinking, thinking, thinking. We're going to change our branch specifier to dollar sha one. Uh, so this dollar sha, uh, this sha one variable is going to get populated by the whoa, by the GitHub pull request builder for us. So uh, you can also, if you, ha uh, I have a link at the very end, but there is, uh, you can set up a parameterized build uh, and feed this in and 
basically test out your pull request builder if you're having issues with running things. The only problem, only caveat with doing that, so to be clear, you know, this build is parameterized, you add a string parameter, and you name it SHA-1, very simple. And that's just a SHA-1 hash of your commit. So if you're having issues with your, your, your pull request builder job, uh, you can do this and then you can just basically hit build now, build, build with parameter, okay, build with parameter, okay, build with, until you figure out what's not working. In this case, we're not gonna do that. Uh, the only, so there is also one other caveat, when you do that, all of the GitHub pull request metadata isn't populated properly. So if you're using any of those variables, uh, so in this particular case, we're using GitHub pull request uh, pull ID, uh, those variables aren't populated, so if you're gonna test, make sure that you add those other variables so that you can test that. Okay, so we've created our repository URL, we've got some credentials that we pre-stored, we have a ref spec, and we've set the SHA-1. So next, we need to use the GitHub pull request builder. Uh, min list. Not sure why I'm not there, but I am now. Uh, so if you have a public facing GitHub, or you have a GitHub or enterprise edition that can talk directly to your Jenkins server, uh, you can use uh, GitHub hooks, so that as soon as a pull request is made or updated, uh, Jenkins will immediately kick off the job. Uh, in this particular case, I'm running obviously on my local laptop, miles, miles away from where GitHub can talk to. So we're gonna leave that one unticked, and I'm, for the sake of testing, gonna update our crontab line so that it runs all the time. And yes, I did th mean to do that. So, uh, as I was mentioning before, we also have the whitelist here, uh, the list of organizations to, to have their members whitelisted, and the tick box to do the to do both allow members of whitelisted organization as admins and build every pull request. Again, note it has the word dangerous. Please tick this option only, only if you're absolutely certain that you trust everyone. You can also uh, whitelist particular branches that you wanna test on so that random branches don't get tested. So maybe you only wanna test your master branch, for example. Uh, so we're gonna go with the world's simplest uh, build environment. Oops, tip falls. Not the slide we want. Let's go for this. And we'll copy and paste that there. Again, we've got very simple, create the directory. Uh, so as I was mentioning before, if you uh, parameterize your build, make sure that you have a, add a parameter for uh, any of these variables that you're using. The GitHub pull request uh, builder plugin page has a, a list of all of the variables that it exposes to you that you can check out. And we're gonna save this. And like all good live demos, we're gonna put our hand in our heart and hope it all works. I like to live dangerously, what can I say? While we're waiting, what we might do is get branch. Which branch am I on? Live demo. Sounds like a good thing. Actually, let's go get checkout master. Let's make that a little better so that everyone can read. Oops. Very good. Branch, we're on our master branch. So let's do get check out, just be live demo real. Okay. Okie dokie, let's do that. is not building, that's fine. Okay, get uh, commit. Pull, pull request. Just you, origin, live demo real. So I've tested this a few times. There is one issue with the GitHub pull request builder is that it will only 
Uh, it won't re-trigger for things that are named the same, which is generally not an issue unless you're like me who has been testing and retesting and retesting this. Uh, so <coughs> now we need to go and do this. Request. Thinking, thinking, thinking. Let's just double check configuration while we're waiting. So now we get to go to the live troubleshooting part of the demo. <laughs> okay, HTTPS, Jenkins, add. Seems happy with that. So it means it check, can check that out. We have that set, and we have our ref spec set. Very good. Sha one, GitHub pull request, blah, blah, blah. let's double check this. We did tick the star. Okie dokie. So, this is, the, this is the great thing about live demos. Oh, did that? No. System log. This is where it tells me New instance is true. Okay, so. Here's one I prepared earlier which I actually disabled because I thought this was all gonna work perfectly. Why are you not working in configure? Just for me, just for me. And we pushed. Okay, stop, start. <laughs> I forgot that I was running that on that server. Okay. Uh, <sighs> if at first you don't succeed, I don't know, there it is. I'm impatient, apparently. 409. Okay, pull request five. Pull request four, there we go. And pull request three should be over there. Very good, okay. So at the moment it's off building those. Uh, and it's built them all. So uh, now I can actually sit down in my browser and compare all three. So PR3.test. Okay. So this is what PR3 test looks like. Uh, you can see very simple PHP. Uh, we've got our horrible little nav thing there, and we can click around it. This is, again, its own environment. Uh, again, I'd like to thank the sponsors, CloudBees, uh, rah, rah, rah. So we can see see what this, this site looks like. So we can then compare that with what PR test four, uh, our pull request number four looks like, which is a much simpler page, uh, and we've only, and it says, hello, JUC San Francisco 2014. And last but not least, we should be able to see what we just did in pull request five. No, I don't want to do a Google search. Thank you, Safari. And that gives us a forbidden page. Why does it give us a forbidden page? Well, so if we have a look at our pull request number five, 
we can see that it only has a readme.md file. There is no index.html or index.php. So it's giving me a forbidden error. So let's have a look at what readme.md looks like. So the great thing about live demos is that you indeed need faith that they will work. Um, so here we have, have three different pull requests and we can navigate through them all. Now, when I was working uh, at, at eBay, uh, and also when, what we were doing at Sears, we had a lot more complicated deployment process. We had a lot more things integrated in, uh, and what we would actually have is the ability to build, again, uh, an entire environment, so a SQL server set up, MySQL server set up, uh, all of the dependent setups. Uh, we actually cr cloned uh, some of the external data directories so that we had uh, images and whatnot that we could pull in specific to just this build that sort of looked like our QA environment so that we could do all of the, the relevant sort of testing without any issues. So there's my faith. Tested. Oh, okay. Oh, let's go a little bit further forward. So there are a couple of pitfalls. With GitHub Enterprise Edition, if you have custom SSL certificates, make sure that your Java instance that Jenkins is running, trust them, because otherwise you'll end up with these weird, could not authenticate to, to uh, GitHub errors, and you'll go, I, and I spent half an hour going, I put in the right password, I put in the right token, I've done all of this correctly. Then you look at the logs and it says, oh, don't trust this certificate, not talking to it. It's like, oh, well, that's not good. Uh, and in, in our case, actually the Sears case, uh, it was a Komodo certificate, but it was a, a special sub Komodo certificate that we used to issue internal stuff, and that wasn't trusted by the default Java key store, so uh, no such luck. Uh, and then the other thing is to make sure that your API, if you're going with enterprise, is set up and working properly before you try and hit it with, with Jenkins because you'll have no end of issues trying to figure out what the problem is. Start with curl, make sure that all of your basic endpoint requests work fine. The other thing I found uh, when building all of this is that make sure that if you're gonna set up a pull request job for a particular thing, you only have one of them because they will fight with each other and you end up uh, confusing GitHub because it'll say tests passed and then it'll say this, this build is not, not okay to merge because you've got two different things fighting with each other or it'll go uh, still trying to hear about this, this pull request. So if you're gonna do this, make sure you have one and then have it hooked into your workflow so it triggers uh, your sort of workflow. So there's some further reading. Uh, if you want to find out more about mod, mod vhost alias, uh, the Apache documentation uh, is rel relatively useful. Uh, again, it's Apache documentation, so at times it can be a bit terse. Uh, so they also have another uh, option on mass virtual hosting, which is pretty cool. Uh, and there's also this blog post, which explains it in English in, in case you don't speak Apache. Uh, and last but not least, uh, the GitHub pull request builder plugin page has all of the configuration details that you could possibly need uh, and has, has an explanation of your options. So I'd like to thank our sponsors and have a great day.